Hey, well, good morning, everybody. Let me open us up in a word of prayer and we'll get started. Father, thank you for today. We thank you, Lord, for your prophetic word, which which allows us to have a light that functions in the midst of darkness. We know right now, Father, that the world is in a state of confusion, wanting answers to different things. And you've seen fit to unveil your prophetic truth to us. As you have to the Thessalonians to give us calmness in the midst of the storm. And so, Lord, we need that application today specifically. And we just pray that you'll be with us in the Sunday school hour as we attempt to teach 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and also in the main service as we take a look at the book of Genesis. I pray that you'll be with all the classes meeting today. Pray that you'll be with the special Camp Sunday that's taking place right now. And uh, we just ask, Lord, for your hand of blessing upon this service. We ask for your protection. We ask for your provision. And in preparation for that ministry of illumination, Father, we're going to just take a few moments of silence to do personal business with you so that we can receive everything that you you have for us today. We're thankful, Lord, for the promise of 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, which doesn't renew our position, but it can restore broken fellowship if need be. We thank you, Lord, for the comprehensiveness of your provision for us. We ask all of these things in the name of Jesus and God's people said, amen. Well, as folks are coming in, let's see if we can locate 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And verse 10. And before we get into that, I just want to make a few comments, if I could, about um, the uh, attack that just happened uh, yesterday um, related to uh, Iran's um, attack against the nation of Israel. I didn't look at any news this morning. I didn't have any time trying to get here. So if some major thing happened, just forgive me for that, but, you know, the latest news, unless you've been living under a rock, um, is that Iran yesterday launched, um, you know, in retaliation, supposedly for something that Israel did, launched a series of drone attacks and missiles, not just into Israel, but actually into the city of Jerusalem. There's actually a grid that I use, and I think you should use it too, when you try to interpret things like this. It's Ezekiel 38 and 39. Um, We've done uh, entire in-depth studies through those chapters at this church, which you can find on the SLBC website, entitled The Middle East Meltdown. It's um, one of those chapters that we believe is yet future. It predicts a series of invaders coming into the land of Israel in the last days, yet future. Spearheaded by Russia, who we believe is Rosh from the far north. And then the allies um, would be Turkey, Turkey. Persia, who we think is Iran, 
etc. There's about eight or nine countries identified. Ezekiel chapter 38 and verse 5 mentions Persia as one of the invaders. Persia, to me, is probably the easiest to identify in terms of who exactly Ezekiel is speaking of because uh, Persia has a paper trail. Persia is a country that was prominent in biblical times. It was under the Persians that the nation of Israel returned from the Babylonian captivity, you'll recall. Persia continued on as a modern day country. Persia's name was changed to Iran in 1935. And then in 1979, there was a Islamic revolution in Iran. And the Shah at that time was deposed and replaced by the Ayatollah. And so when that happened, the nation of Iran, formerly named Persia, uh, took on the name the Islamic Republic of Iran. Um, I believe, we believe, that that is who Ezekiel is seeing in his vision when he sees this invasion of the last days coming against the nation of Israel. One of the principal players would be Iran. And one of the things to understand about Iran is that ever since the theocracy was established, Iran has been um, at war with the West. It just hasn't been formally declared yet. She's been at war with Israel because of Shiite Islamic uh, belief system and the West as a whole. So in that type of mindset, they refer to us as the little, excuse me, Israel as the little Satan and the United States as the great Satan. I mean, this is something they chant over and over again. This is something that their smallest of children learn in compulsory education, you know, death to Israel, death to the United States. It's not an issue with the Persian people who are wonderful people. It's uh, an issue related to the regime of Iran. And um, because of my friendship with uh, Brandon House, I get a chance to be on a lot of different um, cable type dialogues uh, we're going to have one tonight, by the way, if you're interested, at worldviewweekend.com. And also, it'll be simulcast at a place called patriot.tv, if you're interested in that. So I, I'm kind of brought in sometimes to the panel to give a biblical explanation, but I get to sit there and listen to all these generals talk, colonels and generals and I was on one of these, I think it was Friday, and the general that was on with us said, Iran has been at war with the West and, the, and Israel since uh, 1979. It's just they've been doing it covertly. So up to this point, when Iran carries out its dirty work in the world, and as you probably know, Iran is the number one state sponsor of terror around the world, they typically work through proxies. So they work through Hezbollah, they work through the Houthis, um, they work through Hamas. You know, even what happened to Israel recently beginning October the 7th with Hamas coming from Gaza, you know, most people in the know see Iranian handprints over that whole thing. So this has always been very interesting to us from a prophetic angle because we knew that based on Ezekiel's prophecy that Iran or Persia would arise. She would actually develop hostile intentions towards Israel, which happened in 1979. So when Iran is in, involved in all of these sort of covert anti-Israel you know, activities, it's always gotten our attention because we see this not so much as the fulfillment of Ezekiel 38 and 39. A lot of prophecy teachers today are saying Ezekiel 38 and 39 is being fulfilled. I, I'm not one of those. But I do believe in prophetic stage setting. Prophecies are such that they just don't happen in a vacuum. 
the stage has to be set, the nations have to be in place, the chessboard has to be arranged, uh, etc., to set the stage for the fulfillment of God's end time program, which involves this coalition of nations invading the nation of Israel in the last days. So the big thing that shifted yesterday is now Iran is not operating covertly anymore. I mean, it's, and they're claiming credit, uh, missiles <laughs> coming from Iran, not Hamas, not the Houthis, not Hezbollah, but from Iran itself, not just into Israel, but into the city of Jerusalem. So it's almost like God is allowing this to happen just so that there's no ambiguity on the subject matter. When it comes to Iran, uh, there's no camouflage anymore. <laughs> the, the mask is completely off, which to my mind makes the Ezekiel 38 and 39 uh, scenario all the more credible. It doesn't make it less clear, it makes it more clear. The things, the nations to keep your eyes on are number one, Turkey. Turkey, you can see on the map there, and then I have a circle around Persia where Iran is located. Turkey is represented, and obviously I don't have time to get into it here. You can go back to our Middle East Meltdown series to get the documentation on this. But Turkey, just to Israel's north there, is represented by Meshach, Tubal, and Gomer, and Tagarma. And then far north, Rosh, you know, we believe is Russia, Again, go back to the series to get the documentation on this, but Gesinius, a well-known Hebrew lexicographer, said in the 1800s that Rosh is undoubtedly the, what we would call today the, 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 the Russians. So again, I'm not making statements here about the Russian people, the Persian people, the Turkish people. These are statements about the regimes that control those parts of the world. Ezekiel 2,600 years ago said those nations would become hostile towards Israel and turn against Israel. And it probably seemed like a very bizarre prophecy from Ezekiel's vantage point because when Ezekiel received that information from the Holy Spirit 2,600 years ago, Persia was one of the good guys. And so probably in his wildest dreams, he could never see Persia turn against the nation of Israel. In fact, the prophecy seemed bizarre up until the Islamic revolution in 1979, because when the Shah was in power, he was actually an ally of Israel and an ally of the United States. But the interesting thing about God's word is if you give it enough time, world events will eventually catch up to what God said would happen. And so God said Russia, formerly a Christian Orthodox country, prior to the communist revolution of 1917, Persia and Turkey, Turkey also once an ally of Israel. Turkey is the place where Israelis went to take their vacations at one point. But Ezekiel's prophecy said all three, the big three as I like to call them, Iran, Russia, and Turkey would turn against Israel. And so that's exactly what you're seeing happening in your headlines. And the concepts that are mentioned in Ezekiel are not becoming more and more ambiguous. They're coming out with greater and greater clarity and greater and greater boldness. It's just the unique time period that God has allowed us to live in. So I think what you're going to start seeing more and more is Russia and Turkey condemning any nation like the United States and Jordan that would dare help Israel during this difficult time. And so as you start seeing that happen and information continues to come in, so I don't even know what the latest is this morning, but I believe what you're gonna to start to see happen is both Turkey and Russia siding with Iran in this latest skirmish. And you'll look at that and you say, well, there it is, the coalition 
of Ezekiel 38 and 39 is not becoming more ambiguous. It's coming closer uh, into focus. And so I think that's the right biblical lens through which to view these things. Which means God is essentially wrapping up human history is what this means. And I am not a date setter nor the son of a date setter. Um, I am, as you know, for a lot of reasons, a pre-tribulational rapturist. But I look at these largely as signs for the coming seven-year tribulation period. And if the Christmas tree lights and the Christmas music in the department store tell me that Christmas is near, and I'm hearing that I'm watching those signs develop in October or November, I also say to myself, Thanksgiving is coming even faster, right? And that's the right way to understand these things. Um, as you see the signs developing for the Great Tribulation period, to, to me these are obvious signs. They're, they're almost undeniable. What's happening is the Tribulation period is coming and it's casting a shadow. Someone who's tall, for example, like myself, I, if I enter a room at the right angle, you can see my shadow long before you can see me, right? <laughs> The, the shadow is not me, it's a prefigurement of me, but I'm the reality that's coming. That's essentially what our world is moving into. And I'm just giving you here one or two signs or three signs from the Middle East. Uh, and we could talk about a plethora of other signs related to a whole other, all kinds of other different subject matter as well. So Iran is not secretive anymore about this her intentions concerning Israel. Russia and Turkey are falling into proper um, alignment. But there's some very good news in the whole thing. And this is what your average person watching cable and monitoring the latest developments doesn't understand unless they have the Bible as a background. I Iran is not gonna win this. Neither is Russia, neither is Turkey. Because God says in his word, going back to Jeremiah 31, verses 35 through 37, that as long as there's sun, moon, and stars, Israel will always be a nation before him. You know, you can speak against Israel, you can plot against Israel, you can launch military warfare against Israel, but Israel is kind of like the Timex watch, you know, takes a licking and keeps on ticking because God <laughs> has, has purposes for the nation of Israel. And so that's why Israel will win ultimately in spite of different, casualties that she's now suffering, but in the end she will win. So this, this is what you tell the unsaved world. So this is really not a time of fear, for fear. I mean, the world is just gripped with fear that this is happening. But as a Bible reader, you don't have to be gripped with fear. And in fact, it ups your game in terms of your evangelism because your coworkers and your unsaved family members see that you have a different perspective on it. And you have a different perspective on it because you're coming from the perspective of God's word. So it's almost as if God is setting up things so that people have to make a decision. I think it was Billy Graham's ministry, somebody's ministry. It was called the Day of Decision. I love that title because that's what the Bible forces humans to do. Choose. Um... I was looking not long ago at the book of Joshua, chapter 24 and verse 15. I thought it was Joshua 24, verse 15. Maybe it's 16. Well, it's in 24, I know that much. But it basically says, choose ye this day whom you shall serve. 
And it's here Joshua says, you know, as for me and my house, um, where is it? 15, okay, I was in the right place. If it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, there it is, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are now living, and I like this part here, but as, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So all of these things that you're seeing is really part of the angelic conflict. Satan's agenda has always been to eradicate the Jewish nation and the Jewish people. I mean, that's been his plan going all the way back to Old Testament times. God's plan is to sustain the nation of Israel, protect the nation of Israel, and ultimately one day in the faith restore the nation of Israel and then fulfill all of his promises via the millennial kingdom in and through Israel. So that's the angelic conflict. And it's almost like God is arranging things where people have to make a decision. I mean, the, the contrast could not be clearer. If you, if you don't want to be on God's side on this, there's plenty of opportunity for you to be against God. In fact, the mantra that used to be whispered in secret is now being shouted from the rooftops. The mantra is from the river to the sea. The land of Palestine shall be free. And you get some very young college kids chanting that, and most of them don't even know what they're chanting, but they're, they're, they're basically taught that we wanna get rid of the oppressors. Israel, they think, is an oppressor, which Israel is not. That section there on the southwestern part of the map, Gaza, where the events of October the 7th took place, where Hamas used that as a beachhead to launch all of those attacks into the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel actually gave that territory back to the inhabitants of Gaza in 2004. That's not what oppressors do. It, at one time, 2004 was beautiful beachfront property. It was like a resort and it contained uh, botanical gardens, it contained natural resources, uh, potential, all kinds of potential uh, discoveries of natural resources, and once Israel turned that over, the inhabitants of Gaza had one election, they've only had one in their history since gaining that territory, they elected Hamas, Hamas in Hebrew means violence. Uh, Hamas, Hebrew violence, coming from a similar Semitic name, meaning violence. And they completely destroyed Gaza, totally destroyed it. This is where they started to turn it into a virtually a terrorist war camp. And uh, they built, you know, their rockets and missiles and actually tunnels that go underground into Israel proper. I was actually in Israel when some of those in Gaza went through one of those tunnels in, of terror and kidnapped some Jewish youth on their way home from school. And so when October the 7th of last year happened, Gaza was the instrument, you know, that was used for that attack. Uh, no doubt Iran at that point functioning in a proxy sense was funding so much of it. So obviously Israel cannot be an oppressor if she's turning territory over to people and they're abusing it and they're using it as a war camp, which it now is. And so Israel now is trying to go into Gaza not to attack the so-called Palestinians the way the news uh, focuses on it, but to root out Hamas out of Gaza is what's happening. And um, so Israel obviously is not any kind of a, a, terrorist, a terrorist state at all. In fact, the Arab population in the nation of Israel since 1948 has not decreased, but it has increased. 
So if Israel is trying to be some kind of genocidal apartheid state, she's doing a really lousy job of it. And by the way, you can have non-Israelis ascend to the highest levels of government in the Knesset, in the Supreme Court. So, so obviously Israel is not an apartheid state the way the youth today are being taught. But they get in these, under these teachers and professors, they get out into the streets or in public places, and they basically start to chant from the river to the sea. It used to be that when people said that, it was only the crazies that say that kind of thing. Now it's becoming almost mainstream. So the river is the Jordan, the sea is the Mediterranean, and what they want to do is they want to eradicate any Jewish presence in between the two. That's what is meant by the expression from the river to the sea, the land of Palestine. By the way, a, a wrong title for that part of the world. It's called the nation of Israel. The land of Palestine shall be free. So if you want to side with that, um, there's plenty of opportunities in our country to do that. And once you take a side on that, you just took a side in the angelic conflict because you've just sided with the devil. The devil wants to blot out Israel. God's whole purpose is to sustain the nation of Israel and fulfill his covenants in and through Israel after he brings them to faith. So that's why the Joshua 24 verse 15 verse speaks to us because it's calling us to make a decision. You have to make a decision on this. The decision is, and, God, and it's almost like God is forcing this clarity so people will have to make a decision. Whose side of this do you want to be on? You want to be on God's side or do you want to be on the devil's side? So I think we have to kind of come to a posture here that we're going to sink our feet deep into biblical soil and stand on God's side. Can I get an amen on that? And you have to make a decision that I'm going to stand with God on this. Uh, me and my house, my family is going to stand with God on this. Me and my church, Sugarland Bible Church, we're going to stand with God on this issue. I would like this to spread into the entire state of Texas. The entire state of Texas is with God on this issue. Uh, the entire United States of America is with God on this issue. So cho choose ye this day whom you will serve. So a lot of times in church circles, a major war or something or skirmish can break out and there's like no commentary from the pulpit about it at all. And I didn't want to be numbered amongst, amongst those that said nothing. So anyway, that's just sort of a broad rubric, you know, through which you can, which you can view these things. God has a plan for history. Things are moving in a God-ordained, God-orchestrated direction. And God loves us so much that he decided to reveal the plan in advance to us and has given us the ability to actually put the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle together so we know where um, things are headed. So I don't think they're going to talk about this kind of thing on CNN. For those of you that watch CNN or MSNBC or even Fox News or any of these other cable outlets, they're just going to narrate what they think is happening without the proper grid or lens of the Bible. So I kind of felt impelled to share that with you. I tried to do it last night in the form of about an eight-minute video, uh, which you can find on my YouTube channel, andywoodsministries.org. And I, I largely believe that our nation, because of this issue that we're talking about here, is hanging in the balance. God in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3 was very clear concerning the Jewish people, the Hebrews. He said, I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. As we're studying the book of Genesis, hopefully what we're seeing is God has obligated himself to bless the world through the nation of Israel. And the moment God made that decision in the form of this promise, 
given then to the patriarch Abram is the moment God knew that Satan would try to stamp out the instrument of blessing, which Satan has tried to do over and over again. He's trying to do it right now. And that's the moment God gave to the Jewish nation and the Jewish people a protection. And he said to the rest of the Gentile world, if you want to be blessed, be a blessing to Israel. If you want to be cursed, curse Israel. Get into this from the river to the sea mindset. And so this is why I'm, I'm struggling with our future as a republic because I don't know what our current political leadership understands about this, but it, it is an objective historical fact that you can study in history. You can study it through biblical nations. Assyria, Egypt, Medo-Persia, Greece, Babylon, Rome, You can study it through modern day nations, whether they be Spain, uh, Britain, Hitler's Third Reich, which was supposed to last for a thousand years. The principle is this, any nation that comes against the nation of Israel finds itself on the ash, either the ash heap of human history or they so significantly decline as a world power that they're no longer a factor. They said that the sun never set on the British Empire until the British Empire, as you study it out, went the wrong direction and their influence shrunk. I mean, this, this happens, <laughs> happens in the Bible. Egypt, the power of the day. Babylon, the power of the day. Rome, the power of the day. The moment they come against Israel in an unfair way is the moment they lose their significance. Take Rome, you know, as an example. I mean, Rome was the known empire of the day in the time of Christ. Uh, Latin was the lingua, lingua franca of the day, the known language of the day. And then Rome in AD 70 came against the Jewish people, killed over a million of them in the events surrounding the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. And look at Rome today. Rome has passed off the scene. Latin is a dead language. But, it, but is it not interesting that tiny Israel today, even though Rome long passed off the scene, is alive and well? And although the Latin language is a dead language, the Hebrew language is intact. Now, what is that? That's the outworking of what God said would happen. So as you look at some of our political leadership and how cavalier they are concerning the statements they make about Israel, and I don't think this means you have to blindly follow everything the Israeli government does. God didn't. God expressed his displeasure with them many times in the Old Testament. What's happening today is not just a gentle disagreement with the administration of Israel at some point. What's developing is a form of what I would call anti-Zionism. Some would call it Christian Palestinianism, where you're moving away from the idea that God is the one that recycled the nation of Israel and put them back in the land. See, see, the viewpoint that I represent here is basically the viewpoint called Zionism. Zionism is the idea that Israel is in the land today because God put them there. They're not there by accident. God recycled them from the nations of the earth back into their own land. Every single Old Testament prophet says this would happen, except for Jonah. Other than Jonah, every single Old Testament prophet predicts this somewhere. And not only is Israel exactly in the right spot theologically, she's in the right spot legally. It was the United Nations which Israel today calls the United Nations, the UN, the United Nothing, because it's 
controlled largely through a group called the OIC. It's called the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. The Islamic states have such a dominant pull in the UN and their, their theology is so anti-Israel that almost every UN resolution uh, that the United Nations makes is anti-Israel. But the United Nations hasn't always been that way. The United Nations in 1947 is the ones that said Israel has a right legally to return to this land. And before that, the World War I powers made a decision in a place called San Remo, Italy, uh, called the San Remo Conference, where they made the exact same decision. And in fact, there's a legal scholar that I enjoy following. His name is Jacques Paul Gautier. You can find his stuff online, <clears throat> a Canadian lawyer who decided to work on a PhD degree in international relations and political science at the University of Geneva in Switzerland. And he wrote a, a doctoral dissertation, hundreds of pages, as a lawyer proving that what Israel is doing today is not illegal. In other words, you can say, the conclusion of his dissertation is you can say whatever you want about Israel politically and policy, on policy grounds, but here's what you can't say. Israel is illegally occupying someone else's land because that's the rhetoric coming out of Iran. Iran keeps calling Israel uh, the aggressor, the occupier, you know, the, the illegitimate usurper. And the truth of the matter is it's untrue. So that's why, and by the way, when Goudier put together his dissertation, his readers, and if you've ever gone through the dissertation process, you know that your readers are going to make or break you because they have to sign off on your academic work. His, his, his readers, graders, were all hostile to his position politically. So Gutierrez had to cross every T, dot every I, and what he produced is a piece of scholarship which is uh, virtually unassailable that the nation of Israel in the land today is not doing anything illegal. And all of his dis dissertation writers, readers rather, having read his written work and the 20 years, this took 20 years for him to do this, <laughs> in addition to his international law practice. So he was very busy, I guess, during that time. Uh, his readers all concluded that what he has produced is a work of scholarship that's unassailable. Now, you'll never hear Gutierrez interviewed on CNN MSNBC, because the whole narrative is Israel has that land illegally and she has to give something up. That, that's a lie. That isn't true. And in the church, ever since Augustine, through what's called supersessionism or replacement theology, people have been arguing that the scriptures are not meant to be interpreted literally. All of Israel's promises have been transferred to the church through a non-literal, allegorical, spiritual, hermeneutic, or method of interpretation. And so um, your average Christian today, if they're connected with a denominational church, is sitting under people that teach replacement theology. They may not know what the name is, but that's the doctrine that they're under. And it's the idea that the church has replaced Israel. God doesn't have any purpose for the nation of Israel yet future. The best that could happen in supersessionism or replacement theology uh, is that Jews could get saved in the church age. But you see, the perspective that you're getting here comes from the perspective of Zionism. Meaning that God has not replaced Israel with the church. If God can replace Israel with the church at will and break all of his promises, then he could take your salvation one day and say, well, I'm not going to honor that anymore. 
the, the issue of replacement theology deals with the character of God. That's why it's a big issue. And that's why Augustine, when he formulated this in the fourth century through his academic treatment on this called the City of God, which was the first formal put together in terms of a treatise on amillennialism as I'm trying to describe it, supersessionism as I'm trying to, to describe it, replacement theology as I'm trying to describe it. When he put all of this together, he put the church under a spell. And it's a spell that the church has been struggling to get out of through literal interpretation ever since the days of the Protestant Reformation. And even the Protestant reformers, Calvin, Luther, etc., although they may have dealt with some of the Augustinian abuses in terms of soteriology, the doctrine of salvation, they didn't touch what I'm talking about here, which is eschatology, the study of the end. So God raised up a new group within his church, the dispensationalists, around the 1800s to take the reformers' hermeneutic that they used to rescue the church from Augustinian overstep in soteriology, and the dispensationalists started to apply that hermeneutic to the whole Bible. And once you start to apply it to the whole Bible, you see very fast that God is not through with the nation of Israel. Yes, Jews are getting saved today, but that's a very <laughs> small prefigurement of what God is ultimately going to do. God has a future for Israel, national Israel. And by the time you get to the end of the tribulation period, every single Hebrew, every single physical descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob on planet Earth will be in faith. And God is going to fulfill his covenants in and through that group of people that we call the Millennial Kingdom. And so in preparation for that, as all prophets said, other than Jonah, God is going to take his people, the Jewish people, from worldwide dispersion called the diaspora. And he's going to recycle back, he's going to recycle them back into their own land in preparation for this great work. And I'm here to tell you, folks, the devil hates it. Because there is not a greater miracle, in my opinion, taking place on planet Earth right now than the nation of Israel in, in existence. The sociologists tell us that when a nation is outside of its land for a few generations... It loses its ethnicity, it loses its language, it loses its cultural identity, and the people just sort of assimilate into the host culture. So that's why you can go through the Bible and you can read about the Jebusites and the Amorites and the electric lights and the out of sights and the termites and the mosquito bites and all the ites and you don't find those people groups in existence anymore because the cultural sociological rule took hold that they were outside of their land for a while and they just assimilated i mean we don't say oh so and so and so and so moved in down the street what a wonderful jebusite couple they are what what a wonderful amorite uh, family because those people groups don't exist because of the cultural rule that when you're outside your land, you assimilate into the host culture. You just have to ask yourself a very simple question. How is it that the Jewish people continue to exist? I mean, we're studying the book of Genesis. We're seeing where the Egyptians called Joseph a Hebrew. <clears throat> Why do the Hebrews... Why did they not stop existing? And they were outside of their land for 2,000 years. Well, they were out, the reason they continue to exist is God would not allow them to go out of existence. It's a, it's a sociological and cultural miracle. And there never has been a nation in the history of mankind 
that was booted out of its land and put into the worldwide dispersion, the diaspora, and then recycled back into that same land 2,000 years later, speaking their same language, having their same religion, having their same culture. So when you look at the nation of Israel, the way I describe it is it's the miracle on the Mediterranean. And there's a lot of people that say, I wish God would do a miracle today. Everything that you're seeing in your news right now is, is an absolute miracle of God. And Satan doesn't like it. Because Israel is the ticket for the coming kingdom. A time period in which Satan will be bound for a thousand years, and then at the end of that thousand year time period, he'll be thrown into the lake of fire. Satan hates the doctrine of the kingdom more than anybody else because he will no longer be the illegitimate usurper over planet Earth. And Satan knows enough of scripture to understand that the kingdom is coming to the world through Israel. And so he works in history to blot out Israel. He's working right now through Iran, the United Nations. I'm hoping and praying, not the United States, to blot out the nation of Israel. So the perspective that you're getting here is called Zionism. It's the mere opposite of Christian Palestinianism or replacement theology. And it's the idea that although we may have general disagreements with the Israeli government from time to time over different issues, we believe that Israel is in the land today because God put them there. And their presence in the land is not doing anything to disrupt any human law whatsoever. The Gutier uh, dissertation proves that, as does the Joan Peters book from Time Immemorial. Joan Peters was sort of, um, I think she passed away recently but I remember her in her older age appearing on Fox News. She was basically a very liberal sort of pro-Palestinian kind of person, kind of journalist. And this was back in the day where journalists actually tried to be journalists. I mean, today people that are calling themselves journalists are really activists, masquerading as journalists. But there was a day when people actually were real journalists, meaning you follow the evidence wherever it leads. And she actually went over to that part of the world to disprove the Jewish claim to the land, because after all, she had been told that the Palestinians had occupied that land from time immemorial. And so she looked through all the historical evidence. She sifted through all the legal documents. She saw that the Jewish people went back into that land, which was nothing more than a, an abandoned desert and started to purchase the land back at real estate prices that were completely insane. They were totally overcharged uh, for what they used to purchase the land. But anyway, she researched all of this. She researched the United Nations Declaration. She researched the uh, San Remo Conference, uh, post-World War I powers. And she said, you know, this, this claim that the Jewish nation has no right to the land, that's, that's, that's just factually wrong. So her work from time immemorial, like the Gutier dissertation, stands out as two really important sources, historically and legally, showing that Zionism is true. So what I am is a Zionist legally. Israel isn't breaking any law. And number two, what I am is a Zionist theologically, because Augustine had it wrong. God is going to fulfill his word literally. He said he would bring them back into their own land. He's moved heaven and earth to do it. Um, I can't remember the exact statistics on it, but there were hundreds of things that had to go right for the nation of Israel to be born, born politically in 1948. And every single one of them went, went the correct direction for Israel. 
including the United Nations resolution after the fact. The United States, then under Harry Truman, sometimes called the Cussing Baptist, Harry Truman. Harry Truman was one of the first, if not the first, to recognize the modern state of Israel once she declared her independence. And the reason he recognized Israel's existence is because he was raised as a Baptist. And he remembers his um, Sunday school teachers, etc., talking about the nation of Israel. So the genetics of the United States of America is essentially pro-Israel. I mean, that's our DNA. In fact, it was George uh, Washington in what's called the Toro Synagogue in Newport, Rhode Island. And if you have a chance to go visit that, you should. <clears throat> because um, it really will show you the secret of America's greatness. George Washington, our federal acting head, went to, was invited to a worship service in a synagogue in Newport, Rhode Island. It was the first synagogue built in the United States. And he wrote to them a letter. They have it enshrined there in the museum. And in fact, this letter is so important, it's been cited, I think, in about three or four freedom of religion cases in the United States. But he wrote to the Jewish people a letter, and he, he thanked them for the opportunity to be with them. And then he started to quote their scripture about sitting under your own vine and fig tree and none will make you afraid. He says that's how it's going to be in the United States for the Jewish people. You can worship as you want. You can build your synagogues. You're not going to be harassed. And he gave to the Jewish people a gift that they've never had before. Because almost everywhere they went in the diaspora, they've been persecuted. He said, here in the United States, it's going to be different. So I believe that that's one of the things that ha has come into existence that has blessed the United States. Because God, if you take him at his word, said he would do that. I will bless those who bless you. And then you fast forward to Harry Truman, the cussing Baptist, who was the first to recognize the Jewish nation. And then you sort of fast forward to the um, Yom Kippur War, where then Golda Meir, this would be around 1973, was trying to get in contact with our White House because it looked like the enemy was winning. In fact, they had already prepared for Golda Meir, her own suicide pills that she was supposed to take. That's how sure uh, Israel was in terms of thinking that they would lose. And she kept trying to get in touch with our White House. And it was then Henry Kissinger, a, J a Jewish person himself, who was sort of running interference for the president, Richard Nixon, under the guise of, well, let the Jews bleed for a while, was his mentality. So some way, somehow, she got to Richard Nixon in the middle of the night. Richard Nixon, you know, picks up the phone, gives the right order to give Israel what she needs. And when you study Golda Meir's account of that, had Nixon not done that, Israel would have lost. Of course, we know that probably couldn't have happened because the hand of God is on Israel. But to her death... To her dying day, <clears throat> excuse me, she called Richard Nixon my president. And there's actually the backstory of it is Nixon, if you know anything about Richard Nixon, certainly not a perfect person. By the way, do you, do you all know that God doesn't use perfect people? Because there aren't any. <laughs> that means I can apply for the job, right? Richard Nixon was basically raised in a very uh, devout Quaker home. 
In fact, I've, I've visited uh, there in, I think it's Yorba Linda, California, the Richard Nixon Presidential Library. They've got the house set up, you know, exactly what it was like when he was a little boy, etc. And according to his own account, his mother was reading to him the book of Esther when he was very young. You know what the book of Esther is about. Haman's plot to blot out the nation of Israel. And she said to her son, almost prophetically, that if you're ever in a position of authority, you should use that position of authority to be a blessing to the Jewish people. Nixon claims that when he got that phone call, <clears throat> excuse me, from Golda Meir in the wee hours of the night, that's what went through his mind. So you think um, reading the Bible to kids at night is a waste of time? I mean, you have no idea what God's going to do with that. So that's what Nixon did. <clears throat> he told her on the phone, I finally realized why I became president. That's what he said to her. Gave her what she needed. The nation of Israel survived the uh, Yom Kippur War, 1973. So you take George Washington, you take Harry Truman, you take Richard Nixon, you can see the DNA of the United States of America is pro-Israel. I mean, we're in a pro-Israel country. That's what is bothersome to me about the current leadership that doesn't seem to get these facts. Perhaps the only thing that's keeping God's hand of blessing on this country is our commitment to the Jewish people. And all of these things are happening at a time when the church, influenced by Augustinian replacement theology, has almost gone silent. Well, we're not going to be silent here, are we? Um, we're going to talk about the prophetic significance of the things you're seeing on the news, why they're important, and why we, made to, we need to make a stand. Can I get an amen on that? So that kind of blows the Thessalonian study for today. <laughs> so let's pray. Father, we're grateful for your truth, grateful for your word, grateful for how it helps us, help us to be discerning believers in these last days. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name and God's people said, amen. Happy intermission.